Hey guys, my name is Trevor Sullivan and welcome back to the Stratus Grid YouTube channel. I'm a solutions architect with Stratus Grid, and in this video, what I wanted to explore with you is the topic of using table scans inside of the Amazon DynamoDB service. Now, on the Stratus Grid YouTube channel before, we have a couple of other videos on DynamoDB. The first video that we published on DynamoDB actually covers how to use the AWS SDK for Rust in order to create a DynamoDB table and then insert items into that table. And then in our other video, we actually talked about how to use the query operation from the Rust SDK for AWS in order to query a specific partition in a DynamoDB table. Remember that when you create a DynamoDB table, you have to specify at the minimum a partition key attribute. And that is how the DynamoDB service is going to segment your data into different partitions based off of the value in that attribute for each item inside of your Amazon DynamoDB table. And then when you par when you query a specific partition, you specify the value for that attribute that you want to use to identify which partition you're going to query data from. So query operations are specific to a partition based on the value that's passed in for the partition key. But with table scans, we don't actually have to assume in advance that you actually know what a partition key value is. So we can actually just scan over every single row in an Amazon DynamoDB table and grab that data without having to know the values up front for that partition key or the sort key as well. So table scans are a very inefficient operation. Anytime that you see somebody using table scans inside of your application code, that should set off alarm bells in your mind or red flags because there's probably a more efficient way of writing that same code or accomplishing that same objective. So if you do see that, just think about if there's a better way to write that code that can better optimize the use of your read and write capacity units in your DynamoDB table. So we are going to be exploring table scans here and some of the capabilities that it offers. I did want to note, however, if we go over here and check out the documentation uh, working with scans in Amazon DynamoDB, there are some special considerations with scans that you'll want to think about. One of those considerations here is that a scan operation can only return up to one megabyte of data. Now, if I'm recalling correctly, Amazon DynamoDB items can be up to 400 kilobytes in size. So if we maybe round that up to 500 kilobytes, you can fit approximately, assuming that each item is a, its maximum size, you could fit about 20, maybe 21, 22 items into a single request. And then if you want any additional items, you'd actually have to paginate over the data in order to get the next page of data until you eventually reach the end of the table. So table scans are not really that impactful for very small tables where you have, you know, small documents or small items in your table and you're not really returning that many documents. So maybe you've got a small table like the one that I have right over here. If I take a look at the table items here, you can see I've only got seven items in this table. So this is a very, very, very small table. And you can see I've only got three attributes for each of my items here. And these are not very large values, right? It's not like I'm writing several kilobytes of data into the values for these attributes. It's very short values to store in this table. So from a performance perspective, you're not really going to see any kind of meaningful impact to your performance. But again, you want to be thinking at scale where you've got maybe hundreds of thousands of you know, entries in your database or your database table, I should say, in DynamoDB. And then you're going to start to see really significant performance impacts based on the table scans versus partition queries, right? So I am going to be using this table here as a simple example, since we've already talked about how to create a table and insert items into that table. So in particular, if we take a look at the scan operation right here, there are a few different parameters that we can specify. So one of the things that you can do is to actually specify a server side filter. 
So the data still has to be retrieved from the underlying Amazon DynamoDB partitions. But on the server side, on the DynamoDB service side, before the response is sent back to your calling application, you can specify a filter expression. And we actually talked about this concept in the video where we talked about queries. So you can do a filter expression here, and that allows you to specify something like, you know, partition key equals a certain value. That's totally optional. But again, it's not going to be as efficient as a query because a query is only targeting a specific partition, whereas this filter expression is being applied to every single item within the table. So it does have to retrieve the data from the table in order to analyze it against this filter expression here. So that's something you want to think about is that you are able to specify that filter if you would like to. But something that you want to keep in mind is that the performance impact to your table is still taking effect here, right? So we're retrieving the data and then we're passing it through this filter expression. But if we choose not to return that data back to our application, yes, we save on the network bandwidth of not having to transmit that item back to the application across the internet, but we still had the performance impact to the DynamoDB table itself in having to retrieve that item in order to analyze it against this server-side filter expression. Now, when it comes to paginating results here, we have to think about, all right, how do we process each page of data, right? So generally speaking, you're probably going to have something like a looping construct in your application, assuming that you need to iterate over every single item inside of your DynamoDB table. If you imagine that you have a table that has, let's say, 10,000 items, there's a good chance that you're not going to be able to fit all 10,000 of those items inside of a single one megabyte response back to your application. So we need to paginate over that data in order to process every single record in the table. And when you get a response from the DynamoDB service, there's actually this attribute called last evaluated key. And you can take that last evaluated key, which includes the partition key and the sort key or hash and range key, they're also known as, for the last item that was evaluated. And then you can actually take that item and then feed it into the next request so that the DynamoDB service can pick up from where it left off and continue with the next page of data. Now, depending on the size of your items, you could actually get a different number of items returned. The first query that you run might have 20 items. The next query that you run might have 50 items. It really just depends on how much data can fit into each response that's coming back from the service. And there is a way to actually determine how many items are coming back from the result a response back to your application. So if we take a search for counting here, you can see that we've got the scanned count. So that's how many records or items were actually scanned in the table. And then we've got the count here, which is the actual number of items that passed the filter expression criteria and were ultimately returned back to the calling application. So if your count is less than your scanned count, that means that you are essentially wasting table capacity because you're scanning items, you're retrieving and evaluating each of those items in the DynamoDB service, but you're not actually returning them back to the calling application. So that wasted uh, DynamoDB read capacity unit is ultimately just kind of pointless, right? So you want to think about that. Again, this is why table scans are not very efficient because a query in DynamoDB is going to allow you to kind of really zero in on the specific data that you need and only retrieve the items from the actual underlying table storage that your application needs. But this is returned as part of the response. So we can simply retrieve that data and figure out exactly how efficient our application is being with the table scan operation. All right, so I think that's pretty much everything in theory that I wanted to cover ahead of time. What we're going to do now is actually spin up a brand new project so that we can write our Rust code in order to perform a table scan operation and see exactly how this works. I guess one other thing I did want to mention, though, is that I've actually got the REST API documentation right here for the scan operation. So this is the actual REST API that's being wrapped by the various SDKs like the AWS SDK for Rust, for example. But if you take a look at the input parameters for the 
request that you make during a table scan operation, you're going to see that we have this exclusive start key here. This is going to allow us to specify which item we want to start at based on the where, where the previous request left off. This allows us to paginate data. We also have the ability to do our filter expression right down here. And then we also have the ability to limit how many records. So if we want to say, uh, put pass in an, an arbitrary limit, like I only want 10 records or I want 20 up to 20 records, right? You can actually specify how many items you want returned with each query operation that you send to the remote service. You do also have the ability to do what's called a projection expression here. And this is actually really nice. We talked about this in the video that I did on DynamoDB querying with Rust. And the projection expression allows you to select certain specific attributes from an item that you want to return in the response. And you can simply discard any attributes that you don't actually need access to. So in the case of our Trevor products table right over here, I could say, all right, well, I want to scan over each row here. So I'm going to start at the top and say scan ones, two, three, four, five, six, seven. But I only want you to give me the name attribute for each of the items that's returned in the table scan operation. So the projection expression allows you to specify which attributes are going to be included explicitly in that response. And that really helps to optimize your network bandwidth because you're not wasting all that bandwidth transmitting all the, pro the attribute values for attributes that your application is not ultimately going to be consuming. So that's something you want to think about as you are attempting to performance optimize your applications with Rust as well. All right, so let's go ahead and create a new project here. So I'm going to fire up my terminal here. I'm going to go to my parent git directory here. And then we're going to do a cargo new. And I'm just going to say Rust Stratus Grid DDB Scans. And then we'll go ahead and say code Rust Stratus Grid DDB scans and open that up in Microsoft Visual Studio Code. And I've actually been getting a lot of questions on my personal YouTube channel about Rust coding in VS Code. I did want to point out that there is an extension that you can install from the extension marketplace here called the Rust Analyzer extension. So if you just search the VS Code Marketplace for Rust, you should eventually come across that Rust Analyzer extension right here. And this is what allows you to get auto completion in your editor here. It'll also show you the error messages in line on the specific lines that have an error in your syntax. And so this is just a really nice extension that helps you write better Rust code and code that actually compiles. So that's a really good thing. So with any new project here, one of the first things we need to do is install the base crates that we need for our project. So what we're going to do is say cargo add, and then we're going to add the AWS config crate, and we're going to specify the features behavior version latest. I actually have another video on the Stratus Grid YouTube channel that talks a little bit about setting up the AWS config SDK. Uh, for Rust here specifically, not to be confused with the AWS config service, which is totally separate. This is just the name of one of the crates that you have to install in order to authenticate to AWS and set up your region, your credentials, and all that kind of stuff. And then the feature behavior version latest here is just a way for the SDK team to release new versions with breaking changes. But generally speaking, you can just use the latest behavior version without having to specify or pin to a specific API version. All right, so now that we've got that, we also want to install the crate for DynamoDB. So if you head over to the crates registry here and just search for DynamoDB, you should eventually come across the AWS SDK DynamoDB crate here. So we're going to go ahead and install this one as well. We'll say cargo add, and I'll specify features, behavior, version, latest for that as well. And then with the AWS SDK, there's everything is done in async. So we need to make sure that we have an async executor for Rust. On my personal YouTube channel, I actually have a video that talks about async in Rust. So feel free to check out my personal YouTube channel, Trevor Sullivan, in order to uh, see the videos on Rust async fundamentals without including all the AWS stuff. But we do need to make sure that we install the Tokyo runtime here. So we're going to say cargo add. Tokyo, whoops, let's say add Tokyo, and then we'll just do features full. And now if we take a look at cargo.toml here, 
we've got all three of those crates specified here. All right, so now that we've got that out of the way, we've got all of our crates. We need to go ahead and set up our authentication to AWS. So what I'm gonna do is head over to the AWS Management Console right here, and we are gonna navigate to the IAM service. And we wanna make sure that we create an IAM user uh, with some static credentials here. You don't have to use this route, but this is kind of the easiest way to get started here. So I've already created this IAM role here, and it's already got a permissions policy attached to it called Amazon DynamoDB Full Access. Based on this little orange icon right here, this is a managed policy that AWS just includes out of the box in your AWS account. You don't have to create that policy separately, but if you want a more restrictive policy, you can go over to policies, create a custom policy that limits access only to a specific DynamoDB table in a specific region as well. And that will allow you to lock things down a lot more strictly based on your application's needs. So what I'm gonna do is go over to security credentials here and I've already got one access key, but I'm just gonna go ahead and create another. I'll just do other option here. And then we'll just skip the description here and I'll just hit the little done button here. Actually, it should be creating my access key there. So let's go ahead and try that again here really quick. Let's go to create other and let's see if we can just refresh the page here and hopefully get this working. All right, so it's working now. So we'll go ahead and copy our access key ID. And what we're gonna do for starters is just set that as an environment variable. Generally speaking, you don't wanna put this in your code, but for the sake of simplicity, I'm just gonna use this in my code for now. So what we're gonna do is go into the standard crate and then say standard env. And then there is a set var function that we can use to set AWS access key ID and we'll just paste that in. And then I'll go ahead and duplicate that line down and we need to set AWS secret access key as well. That'll be our secret key value. And then I'm gonna duplicate that one more time and we're gonna set the AWS underscore region environment variable. And we'll just set that to US West two. Of course, this will depend on where exactly you've created your DynamoDB table. So let's grab our secret key from the console right over here. We'll copy and then paste. And so now we are authenticated and we can go ahead and set up our credentials by doing the AWS config crate. And then we'll just call the load from ENV function. And then we'll go ahead and do dot await here and we'll set the result to the variable AWS CFG. You can call this variable whatever you want to, but ultimately it's gonna return this SDK config object. Now you'll notice that we get this error saying that await is only valid in the context of an async function in Rust. So of course we need to set up our main function as async. And then we're also going to add the Tokyo main macro here. And that's going to allow our main function to run inside of the context of the Tokyo executor. And so now our async code will work perfectly fine. So at this point, if we go down to our terminal here and just do cargo build, this should compile just fine. And now that we've got our SDK config object here, we can go ahead and create our DynamoDB client. All right, so what we're gonna do to create the DynamoDB client is go into the DynamoDB crate right here. We're going to create a client and we'll just say new. And then what we're gonna do is reference the AWS CFG variable here. Let's just do a borrow ampersand AWS CFG. And that's going to return the client object. Let me close the terminal there really quick while it's compiling. And I'll just do a variable called let DDB client equal this result here. So now we've got this client object and we can call the scan API directly against that client object. So we'll do DDB client dot scan. This will go ahead and create a scan fluent builder right here. And then what we can do is set up all the input parameters on that, like the table name, for example. So we'll do dot table name, and then we'll set that to Trevor dash products. And I'll say, let scan result equal the result of this. And remember that with the AWS SDK for Rust, when you call an async SDK function, like the scan operation here, after you set up all of your inputs, 
like the table name here or the last evaluated key in order to paginate on data or anything like that. We also have to call dot send, and then that's going to return a future. So we also have to do dot await on that, and that will cause our code to block until we actually get the final result here. So once we get the result from the scan operation, we're going to get the scan output object, but that's wrapped in a result. So we need to check to see if the result is OK or if it has an error, and that will handle it accordingly. So one way to do this is with an if statement, but the more rusty way to do it is with a match statement here. So I'm going to say match scan result. And then under the code branches, under our match here, we're going to say that if it's OK, then I want the results in a results variable. And then we'll go ahead and put that into a code block. But then we also have to handle the error situation here. So the match statement will not allow you to just skip handling the error operation. So we actually need to do an error and then say ddb error. That's the variable that'll get populated with the error if it is present. And then we'll do a fat arrow into a code block. All right, so now right here on line 15, we can put some code if the result is successful and actually returns something. And down here on line 18, we can put any code that we want to do if there is an error. So I'm just going to say print line down here, and we're going to put in a placeholder, and we are going to do a colon question mark here so that we can print the debug output, and then we're going to pass in ddb error here put a semicolon at the end. And so now if there's an error during this operation right here, like let's say maybe the table doesn't exist. So we'll do Trevor products non-existent, for example, because that table doesn't exist in the US West 2 region. And so now if we do a cargo run operation right down here, let's see, we should get this error here. And ultimately the error is going to say something along the lines of requested resource not found or table not found or something like that because the table with that name simply does not exist. But if we go back and change the table name to Trevor-Products, we'll get rid of that non-existent part there, do a cargo run. This time we should actually get a successful result and you can see no error is printed out because this empty code branch right here actually executed and it by default skipped over the error because the OK branch is what matched. So now we could just put something here like print line, the table scan operation was successful. All right, so now if we do a cargo run again, we should just see a generic message saying that it was successful. All right, so come on, go ahead, run, run, run. And it looks like we actually got some kind of time out there. So let's go ahead and try it again. And sure enough, it was successful. All right. So now what can we do with this scan result that we got? Or that I should say the scan output, right? Because this result is actually getting the success output from the result object here, which is the scan output object. So one thing that we could do is to head over to the Rust documentation, docs.rs. And we could do a search for DynamoDB. And we want to find the AWS SDK DynamoDB crate, which is right here. And then if we search for scan output, we can see exactly what that is going to give us. So here's the data structure for the scan output. So you can see that we've got the actual items right here. So the items have, is wrapped in an option type here, which means that there could be some results or there could be none. You could have an empty table, in which case items would be none because there aren't any items, right? The request was valid. The scan operation worked against a table that exists in your AWS account. But since there's no items to return, you just get none as the option return value. But in most cases, if you actually do have items in the DynamoDB table, then option will be sum, at which point you can simply unwrap it and retrieve the inner value, which is a VEC of hash maps. And each of those hash maps is of type string as the key, and the value is the DynamoDB attribute value, which is a generic type that allows you to retrieve string values, binary values, number values from DynamoDB, and things like that. So attribute value supports things like bools, uh, bool sets, 
Uh, you have uh, number sets as well, kind of like arrays. You have string sets, you have strings, uh, singular scalar values, number values. Um, you have hash maps as well. So things like that. And then under the scan output struct, we also have the count. So that's the items that were actually returned back to our application. We also have the scanned count. So that's how many items were actually scanned in the operation. We also have the last evaluated key. So if you have scanned the last item in the table, then this will actually be set to none, which basically indicates that there are no more items to scan in the table. And then it also gives you this struct right here called consumed capacity, which will actually tell you how many read and write capacity units were consumed with that particular request. So you can drill into some of these attributes right here, like read capacity units, write capacity units, or just general capacity units right here. Um, you can also look at the indexes. If you have a local secondary index or a global secondary index on your table, we're not going to get into that right now, but that allows you to kind of see how much capacity was actually consumed at the table level or at the index level. All right, so we want to take this scan output struct and we want to grab something like, all right, how many items do we have, right? So we could say count. And then we could actually take a look at the scanned count as well and see how many were in there. So let's do print line. The number of returned items was placeholder. And then we'll pass in for that placeholder right there. We'll take the results variable that contains that scan output struct. And we want to grab the count property from that. All right, I'm going to duplicate that down and we're going to say the number of scanned items was X. And then we're going to say results dot scanned count there so we can see how many items were actually returned. And then we can see how many items were actually scanned to return that. Now, if you don't have any filter expression, then the count and the scanned count should match if you have if you return seven items or if you scan seven items then you should also return seven items because there is no filter operation being applied to those items so every item that's scanned should just automatically get returned however if you do specify a filter expression when you invoke the scan operation right up here i typically like to split these across multiple lines here so that we can add in more parameters here and make things a little bit cleaner, a little bit more readable in our code here, rather than scrolling way off to the side of the screen. But if we specified a filter expression, then the number of items that are scanned could actually be greater than the number of items that are returned because some of the items that are returned are going to, or some of the items that we've scanned are not going to match the filter expression that we have specified. So let's go ahead and run this and just see what we get back. So for now we'll do cargo run. And we should have seven items for both counts. Sure enough, we have the number of returned items was seven, and we've scanned seven items to get those seven. And that's because, again, we don't have a filter expression. But let's go up here to our scan operation, and we're going to do a dot, and then we're going to say filter expression, and we're just going to pass in a string value here, and we'll say category equals kitchen. And I can do this. I can actually specify the value here because it doesn't have any special characters. But if we did something like living dash room here, that would not actually work. So let's try to do cargo run here. And you should see an error come back because the dash is a special character. As you can see, it has a syntax error right where we specified living room. But if we change that value just to kitchen, which is another attribute value that we have in our table, just to show you visually right over here, let's go back to our DynamoDB table here, go to tables, cover products, and then we'll say explore table items. So the category attribute does have, there are five different items that have a value of kitchen for the category attribute. So because the kitchen doesn't contain any special characters, we can just specify that and do cargo run. And now you can see the number of returned items was zero. The number of scanned items was seven. All right, so why is this happening? Why is it saying that none of these actually matched? To be totally honest, I'm not entirely sure because when I tested this previously, I think this worked just fine. But what we can do instead is just put in a placeholder here. So we talked about these 
placeholders that you can put into filter expressions in our DynamoDB query video, but I'll just say something like value. And then we'll do dot expression attribute values. And we want to replace colon value with kitchen. So basically what that's going to do is it's going to pass in the kitchen value for this placeholder right here. And we have to specify this as an attribute value. So let's go ahead and do attribute value. And then we'll say colon S at the end. And then we're going to pass in kitchen dot two string right here. And let's make sure we have the right number of ending parentheses there. And so now we're going to pass this in. All right. So the other thing I'm going to do, I just like to do this for simplicity is say use AWS DynamoDB as DDB. And that way we can use this DDB prefix anywhere that we reference that crate. And that just helps things look a lot cleaner here. So we could also put it there as well. So it's just using DDB as an alias for the proper crate name here. All right. So let's go ahead and try this now. We're going to do a filter operation. Hopefully we get a few items this time. And it's saying the expression attribute values contains an invalid key. And so I guess I do need to put the colon prefix there. Let's go ahead and try that and see if that works. And now, sure enough, you can see the number of returned items was five and we scanned seven. So essentially what happened here is we made a single scan request and all of these items matched. And then the filter expression on the DynamoDB service side went over each of these items and evaluated the category value for each of these attributes here. And so it says, all right, living room, that doesn't match kitchen. So we're going to skip that. Once again, living room doesn't match kitchen. We're going to discard that. And then all these items here that match kitchen under the category attribute are going to ultimately get returned. So we read all seven items from DynamoDB table storage, but we ended up discarding two of those in the filter expression. So that additional read capacity that was used to read these two items right here that didn't match the filter expression was ultimately wasted. And that's exactly why doing a scan operation is not as efficient as doing a query operation. All right, so now we've taken a look at the counts here. So the counts are not always gonna match. You want to make sure that your count ideally is as many as scanned count. But if it's less, then that means that you're ultimately wasting table storage uh, capacity, read capacity units. Something else that we can do is take a look at the last evaluated key. So what we'll do is say print line and say the last evaluated key or item was, and then we'll put in a placeholder here and we'll do a debug output here and then we're going to pass in results dot last evaluated key put a semicolon at the end there for syntax and so what you're going to see is that the last evaluated key right here is of type option so it's an option that wraps a hash map and the hash map contains attributes with a key of string and an attribute value. And these are going to correspond to your partition and range keys or hash and range keys that you have specified for your table. And then it's going to allow us to pick up from that point in the future if we specify that key as the input for our request in the future. So in order to really visualize this, what we want to do is actually add a limit here. So in order to force the scan operation to paginate our data, we'll do dot limit and we'll just set our limit to three. So previously down here, we were able to do a single scan operation that returned seven items, but now we are intentionally limiting it to only returning three items per request. So now if we save that and then run it again, we should only see that three items were returned here. So three items were scanned, only one was returned. So what happened here is it started with these living room items again, and it said, all right, living room doesn't match kitchen, living room doesn't match kitchen. Oh, this one right here, the fork is in the kitchen category, so we're going to return that. And then it just stops right after that. So this kitchen fork entity right here is the last item 
that was scanned by the scan request. So now if we want to pick up and continue with another page of three items or four items or however many you specify in your limit parameter, you can specify this kitchen fork as the input to that request. And right over here, sure enough, you can see that the kitchen fork is the category. That's our partition key. And then the name is our range key or sort key. So how do we do that? Well, what we're going to do for starters is put everything into a loop. So rather than just running a single scan operation and then doing a match right here, we want to turn this into a loop until everything is finished. So we'll create a loop right here, and then we're going to move all the code that actually does the scanning operation right here into the context of that loop. And then once we've done that, let me just fix the indentation here on match. Once we've done that, what we want to do is check to see if there is a last evaluated key because that's an option type, right? So we can check to see if that option is sum or if it's none. That's a Rust concept. It's built into the standard crate in Rust. And so what we can do is then take that last evaluated key and then feed it back into the next request that we specify right up here. But what we're going to have to do in order to specify this is that we're going to have to break apart the construction of the scan operation here from the actual sending. So we don't want to send it immediately. We want to construct most of the request, but then if the last evaluated key is populated, then we want to add that to our scan operation before we actually do a send operation. So what we're going to do is just put a semicolon to cut it off here. And then what we're going to do is say, I want this to be a scanner, not the scan result, because we're not actually sending the request and awaiting the request. We're actually just creating the scan fluent builder construct right here. And then we're going to down here where we actually send the request, we're going to say, let scan result equal scanner dot send dot await. And let me just fix the spelling on that there. All right. So now scan result still contains the final result here, but we have two separate statements in Rust. We have one that creates our scanner and one that actually sends the scan operation. In between these two different statements, what we're going to do is say if and I'm just going to write some pseudocode here so you can kind of see what's happening. We're going to say if the last evaluated key is populated, so if it's sum, right, then we want to take our scanner and we want to add the last evaluated key. So the exclusive start key is the name of that parameter here. And then what we're going to do is specify it as a set of key value pairs. So we're actually going to have to add multiple key and values for the hash key and the range key or partition and sort key, depending on what terminology you prefer. All right. So what we need to do in order to accomplish this, though, is outside of the loop, we need to declare a variable to hold a reference to that last evaluated key. So let's do let uh, last evaluated key and we're going to set that to the type that is expect or returned i should say from this result down here so we're just going to take the option type here we're going to copy that and then we're going to go ahead and specify that as our variable type right up here and then we're going to have to resolve a few of these entities here so i'm just going to do a control dot and say qualify it as a std collections hash map and then do control dot on attribute value. And we'll just say qualify it as a DDB types. You could also add use statements as well, but I'm just going to resolve them in line right here. And so now we're going to also make this mutable so that we can actually set this variable inside of our looping block right here. Let me just comment this out so we don't get confused by that compilation error. All right, so now what we need to do is initialize this to none. All right, so we're going to go over on the far right here and say equals none. So our option type by default is going to be none. But after we execute one of these table scan operations, we're going to 
grab the actual value that got populated and assign it back to this mutable variable because we declared it as mutable with the MUT keyword here. So down here, we're going to say, let's comment this out right here and say last evaluated key equals results dot last evaluated key. And so now we are actually populating this variable. So it's no longer none of the option type. It's, at, it's now sum, right? So again, back right up here, we want to say if sum last evaluated key, then we want to go ahead and add the keys from that hash map. All right, so we'll say if last evaluated key dot is sum, then we want to go ahead and add them. Sometimes if you get an error, you might have to go to your VS Code command palette and run the Rust Analyzer restart server command, and hopefully that'll clear up any cached compilation errors that you have. So as you can see, those compilation errors appear to have cleaned up mostly here, uh, but it looks like we still have this error saying that the variable can't be found in this context here. So it's basically saying that it can't find last evaluated key in this scope. So let's try to rename this to something different. So let's say last key instead, and then we'll set this to last key. And then we'll scroll down here and say last key and actually set that value. And for some reason, it looks like it was conflicting with some local variable. I'm not entirely sure why that was happening, but simply renaming that variable seems to have cleared up that compilation error. So let's go ahead and do a cargo build here and make sure that it's building correctly. All right. So now what we're going to do is basically take the keys from the last key variable here in this hash map, and we're going to add them to the scanner here. So what we'll do is say scanner dot exclusive start key and then we're going to iterate over the elements in the hash map here so we're going to say for item or i should say for last key item in last key dot and then we're going to unwrap this and that's going to unwrap into a tuple type here where we have a string and the attribute value Let's put the scanner.exclusive start key inside there. And so what we're going to do is add the last key item dot zero. That'll refer to this string right here. And then we're going to add in last key item dot one. And that will refer to the attribute value right here. Now you can see we get this message saying borrow of moved value here. And that's because when we unwrap last key right here, it's actually consuming that value. So what I'm going to do is just say last key dot clone dot unwrap, and that will deal with that error there. And then the other thing that we want to make sure that we do is actually reassign the scanner. So every time that we call exclusive start key, we want to assign the new result to scanner. And therefore, we also need to set the scanner as mutable here because we're actually going to be mutating this scan fluent builder object as we iterate over these keys that we're passing into the configuration here. And then finally, we can actually send the scan operation to the remote DynamoDB API and retrieve the result in scan result. So now, the first time that this runs, Last key is going to be none because we initialized it as such up here on line number 13. And then the next time that it runs, it's going to populate last key right down here on line number 37. So then the second iteration of this looping construct here, this code block right here is actually going to run and it's going to add that exclusive start key to the scanner before it actually sends the scan operation to the remote API. And so that'll allow us to ultimately paginate over our data. So let's go ahead and do a cargo run operation right down here. And we should be receiving each time three items until we get to the last one, which is just one. So because we have six items, it does three and then three and then one, and then it ends. However, what we don't currently have here is any way to break out of this. So what we're going to do is that we're going to say that if the last key is empty. 
So if we would try to retrieve the last evaluated key from the results, but it's actually an empty value, then we want to break out of the looping construct. So we'll say if last key is equal to none, then we're going to go ahead and just call break right here. So let's do a cargo run. And this time it should just do iterate over three items, iterate over three items, iterate over one final, the seventh item in our table. And now it has exited because it finished scanning all of the items in our table. So that's how you can use the limit parameter to specify a certain page size of items or a maximum number of items that you want to retrieve. It could end up being less than that limit if they're very large items. So if you say limit 50, but all of your items are using 400 kilobytes as the maximum item size, then in that one megabyte request, you're only going to be able to fit a couple of items in there. I think earlier in this video, I actually said that you could fit like 20 items in there. I was actually basing that on 40 kilobytes, but if you have 400 kilobytes, you'll actually only be able to fit about two, two and a half items in there. So ultimately two items if they are the maximum size. So that's something you want to keep in mind is that the limit is simply a limit. So if, if, if it was going to retrieve 100, you can cap it at 50. But if it was only going to give you 30 because of the size of the items, then that 50 limit is just a desired limit. It's only going to return a maximum of that one megabyte of data. So in any case, that's how we can paginate over our data here and then break out of the loop after we are finished processing. Now, if you have a very, very large table, we're gonna switch context here just a little bit to a slightly different topic. So if we go over to working with scans right here and then do a search for the topic parallel scan right here, something else that you can do in the scan operation is to actually break apart your table into multiple segments. Kind of like the part, the concept of partitions, but it's a lot simpler than that. You're not actually partitioning your data based on attribute values. You're actually just breaking up the entire set of items into a certain number of logical segments. And this allows you to spin up multiple threads or multiple processes in order to process each segment of data independently. So imagine for a moment that you have a DynamoDB table that has 10,000 items, and you need to very rapidly process all 10,000 of those items, or it could be a million or 10 million items, right? So what you can do is specify the total number of segments that you want. So if you have, let's say, 10,000 items, I could say, I want there to be segments of, or I want there to be 10 segments, each segment containing 1,000 items. And then in my application, in my Rust code, I can actually spin up multiple threads and I can specify which segment number I want each of those threads to go process. And so on the backend server side, DynamoDB will go ahead and break up your table of items into those number of segments. And then your application, when it's actually making the scan request, it can specify which segment number it needs to process. And you can just pass that in as an argument into your thread when you actually spawn that thread from your application. We're not actually going to do that because I don't want to get into multi-threading in this video. I just want to keep things kind of as high level as possible here. But I do want to point out that when you're constructing your scanner object right here, whether it's in the main thread or in a kind of child worker thread, you can do dot segment. And I could say, all right, I want this thread to work on segment zero. All right, I want this thread to work on segment one two, three, all the way up through nine, and that would give me my 10th segment. But then in each of those requests, we also have to specify that the total segments is 10. So each of your threads is going to specify that the total segments is 10, but then each of those threads is going to have a different segment number that it's actually processing zero through nine if you have 10 segments or zero through however many minus one based on your number of segments. So if you have, let's say 15 segments, then the maximum segment is gonna be 14 because it's zero based, not one based. So in any case, that's pretty much everything I wanted to cover with table scans. Again, they are inefficient operations because it does require retrieving data from the DynamoDB table. 
in order to evaluate it against a filter expression, whereas in a query that targets a specific partition, you can really narrow down to exactly the data that your application needs. So I hope you learned something new from this video. Thank you so much for watching and we'll see you in the next video. Make sure to like, subscribe to this channel and check back on a regular basis for new videos from Stratus Grid. Take care.